Today, we're looking at a subject matter, a door to more. And this desire for more is not something that is limited to a culture or a people. Uh, it is intrinsic in our human creation. Think about it. A little child, a little baby, comes out of the womb and is carried in the arms of the mother, is fed, changed, every need taken care of it. You'd think that would be the epitome of service, right? But there's something in that child that wants more. It doesn't want to be carted around in arms, and it wants to get out. So the child begins to crawl, and he starts to move around on his own. He wants more. So the crawling turns to, oh, i got to get up. Everyone else is walking around. I want more. I want to, I want to get up and walk. So it's a little teetering. It runs into things. You've got to child-proof our homes. For to- those of you that have toddlers, you know what this like this desire in a child to move faster. I want to do stairs. I want to run. There's this desire for more, to do more, to be more. And this grows and develops. It's it's intrinsic. It crosses every cultural barrier, language, race, economic. It, It is who we are as human beings. Children, teenagers, parents of teenagers. You know what it's like when your child wants more from you? Parents have the keys, and the teenager says, I want the car. I want more time with the car. Goes to the parents, I want money. I want more money. If there's something in you that wants more and more and more, and that's who we are as human beings. God made us this way so that In this earth, we look at everything around us, and we want more. But what we see and observe is finite. It's limited. And so the only place to look is up. God wants this desire in us that we possess for more that is funneled into education, into career, into improving our skills, into making more money, into improving the quality of life for our loved ones. He wants to take us that that desire, and he wants us to direct it upward. That we say, there has to be more. How do I find it? This is what I want to talk to you today. There are three doors to more that, I want to, that we want to look into. The first door is a Passover door. It's the past. Second door is, we'll call it the sheepfold door. This is a present process. A sheepfold. You know what, that, what a sheepfold is? It's like a corral that you keep the sheep in. So a modern day, you'd have a, you wouldn't have a sheep fold, you'd have a barn, and all the sheep go in there. And you'd have a door that opens and closes to keep the sheep in. And, but for our purposes, and biblically, it's, we refer to it as a, a sheep fold. And the third door is a, it's a fellowship door. It's a, a future door, but it's also a present door. So in a, in a spiritual sense, it's right here and now, but in a physical sense, it is a future thing that we look forward to. Now, I'm not a big formula guy, but this is one that really works. Door number one plus door number two really does equal door number three. Now, there are many, let's, let's look at this, if you want to break it up. If, if there are many people today, who, well-meaning persons, that, that want this to uh, know there's more, reach out to God in some way. Um, maybe it's the spiritual part within them. They have different philosophies of how to touch God. They reach out, they want more of God, but they don't go through this first door. So without going through this first door... They're trying to get to God, and all they hit is this glass ceiling. And there's a lot of weird philosophies out there trying to get more to God, closer to God, and not really getting there. There are many other people that go through the first door, 
but it's like they get stuck in that first door. It becomes like a Jesus in me uh, mindset. And, and they want more, but they're hitting the same glass ceiling. They don't seem to break through. Their prayers seem to be limited, and they don't see, where is God? Well, you know, you've saved me, you've, you've, you've atoned for me, I'm born again, but, but there's got to be more. You see, the first door, the Passover door, brings us right to the mercy seat where we are held there secure in Christ. And that's why we call it the first door. Are you here today and have you walked through this first door? Not only the faces that I'm seeing here, But anyone that is hearing this through our media, have you walked through a door named Jesus? We call it being born again. If you have not, today you can walk through that door. And if you have, the good news is, There are two more doors, and we get to pass through them today. The second door, the sheepfold door, is a process which promotes fellowship. Um, It is, it is framed, the second door is framed in the first door. And it is a sheepfold. Now the question to us today is, are you outside of the sheepfold looking in? Or perhaps you're shopping for the the right sheepfold. Or perhaps you've been hurt. Maybe you've built walls emotionally and you prefer your own sheepfold or family of one. But that's not really the sheepfold. And this second door the first door of redemption, the second door of coming into community. It's family, really. That's the second door. And when these two doors, the blood of the Lamb, the mercy seat, secured by Jesus, when that is accompanied with the community of, and fellowship of the saints in the body of Christ, when these two things are combined, guess what happens? the third door opens up. Suddenly, as you're reading the Bible, light comes into your mind, and you can understand what you're reading because you're in fellowship with your brothers and sisters, because the blood of Jesus frames your life. Where are you today? As you look around you in this place, Do you see your family or do you see just people in this place? The people that you're sitting with today, are these people that you connect with personally during the week? People that you sit down and break bread with and talk about Jesus? Because that's that's the kind of activity that happens in a sheepfold you see, in a, if you picture a sheepfold, there's a whole bunch of sheep all milling together and they're kind of crowded and they're blowing, blowing, and they're talking with each other as sheep do. And it's a lot of community, a lot of interaction, right? Um, this, this thing called, well, uh, I don't know, that church can become, where you, you walk in, hide by, and, and, and you walk out and you don't talk to anybody. How is that a sheepfold? And in family, weird things happen. Weird sounds happen, like just what happened. Sometimes, you know how families used to be portrayed on TV as, as the perfect model family? And then in the 80s, I think, there was a switch where dysfunctional families were portrayed as the family. And, and, and the thing was, is 
is that there was a consensus in society, I think, that, hey, everyone's family's a little bit dysfunctional either anyways, so why don't we just promote dysfunction and then we can all feel at home, right? Well, a sheepfold is like that. A sheepfold has a lot of dysfunction in, the, in that sheepfold. There's a lot of bumping and jostling. And maybe feelings get hurt in the sheepfold. But it's a sheepfold. It's a place to be. It's a safe place because the wolves are outside. And the sheepfold is a place of growth and development. And that's why door number two is essential when built upon door number one, to have heaven open and have this fellowship of door number three. Now, Jesus is all three of these doors. <laughs> this is so beautiful. This is not a, a, a ta- an academic talk of theology and, and you know, this and A plus B equals C. No, Jesus himself is door number one. Because the, his blood, why, what, is, what is the meaning of the blood of Jesus? It's his life. Life flows in our blood. The life of Jesus is door number one. And door number two is the sheepfold. Well, Jesus is that environment that we live in, his life. His body is the sheepfold. The sheepfold is Jesus. And door number three the fellowship of Jesus. It's Jesus. He's the word that we fellowship around. Jesus is the the light. The first door, life, the blood, is Christ. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The life, the first door. The truth, the second door. And the way, the light, the fellowship, is Jesus. You know, the first Christians, before they were known as Christians, were known as the followers of the way. Because they were known in their communities as people who lived with an open, open heaven. And they were all talking about Jesus is the way to, that this can be open. We don't have to be earthbound. There's a, there's a, that glass ceiling can be broken and you can be open and up. And so they were known as the people of the way. So let's, let's unpack this a little bit. Um, if, if this sounds a little bit familiar, it's because it really is building upon the message that our brother Edwin shared a couple weeks ago. In, of, with, yes. In, is the first door that brings us into Christ. Of, it's that second door. Whereas in fellowship and in jostling and in and, and experience as a process, Christ comes into us, we get out of ourselves, and all of this happens in community. And the net result of fruit is his righteousness, where not of our own doing, by grace, we are known as of him, we are seen of him. And then the third door, these two things together open up the with, which is through being with him. So let's look at this first door, redemption. It's really an object lesson, the first door. Um, it's an object lesson. Remember what I said before about what a type is in Scripture? You know how when we talk, we, we make a point. And then we say, oh, let me, let me illustrate this point with an example, right? Well, what God does, is because he, he's outside of time, he, he can do this. He does it in reverse. So in the Old Testament, using the whole living history of the people, his chosen people, the Israelites, he gave examples, living examples, of the points he would be making in his church in the New Testament. So the, one of these things is, is the Passover. So the first door, the Passover door, they were told to put blood on the lintel, which is the top of the door, the lintel, and the two side posts. I want to read you this, this passage from, from Exodus. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two door posts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood 
shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will pass over you. Who is passing over, over us? It's the judgment. It's the angel with the sword. It's, it's something that you don't want to be out. Uh, you want to be inside at that time. I will pass over you when I see the blood, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. We, this is the Passover door. This is the first door. It was actually a door with, with the blood over it. It was an object lesson for us. And the question is for us, sitting here today, hearing this today, do you have the blood of Jesus on the lintel and on the side posts of the door of your heart so that that blood totally encircles you? Because this, this door, this, this door of the blood of Jesus totally, totally envelops us. Now, you notice that when we talk about this door at the very beginning, I said it's a past tense. It's a done deal. You pass through this door once. You don't need to keep passing through it. I remember explaining this to children once, when every time the invitation was given to ask Jesus into your heart, they wanted, uh, you know, certain children would want to come forward again. They say, yeah, I want to ask Jesus into my heart again. Well, it has to be explained. Well, you already asked Christ into your heart. He's there. You don't need to keep asking him in. It's, it's, it's a moment of time when you accept that the blood of Jesus covers you and you, you come in and you are what we would call born again. This happened historically at a certain point in time. I don't know the exact date when Jesus was put on the cross. But history tell us, tells us at that time, the temple veil separating the holiest of holies from the holy place was torn in two from the top to the bottom. How is that possible? Now, without getting into a lot of detail about the temple, the holy of holies was a place reserved. Only the high priest could go in there once a year. And it was covered, separated by this wall, this veil, this thick, solid curtain separating. No one could pass through. What was, what was so precious? What was so, um, what could no one go near? It was the mercy seat. On the ark, it was a mercy seat. Cherubim covered it, and that was the mercy seat. The presence of God. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, when his blood was flowing, when his blood, there was a trail of blood going from the cross to where he was scourged and beaten. That Roman court where his blood splattered on all the Roman soldiers who were scourging him. His blood. When he was on the cross and his blood was spread, the veil of the temple to that holy of to the mercy seat was torn open. And at the same time, you're, you're reading the, the verse on, on your screen in, in, before you. At the same time, graves were opened up and people that were dead, buried, actually got up and walked and talked around Jerusalem. <laughs> Imagine the scene. This happened at a particular time where the tail, the veil was torn, people got up, resurrection happened, and people are walking around. This, do you see, do you see the, 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 the picture here? The, ta- the veil, open, resurrection, life. It happened. Now, Paul explains it a little bit better in, in, more in our language in, in Ephesians uh, chapter uh, 2. He says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive. Notice the past tense, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up. Notice the past tense, raised us up. Done deal. He raised us up together and made us sit. Past tense. 
raised us up, made us alive, made us sit, past tense. All of this is part of this first door by which we can say confidently that we are in Christ. Now, the second door is a process. It is present, and it takes what the first door accomplishes positionally, and it translates it experientially into our lives. And this is why it's so important for us, for, for the body of Christ to click with us, that we that we latch on to each other in community. Because if we are limited to the first door and we don't embrace the second door, do you see what happens? All that we are in Christ positionally is never experienced subjectively. Isn't there something in you who are in Christ positionally that cries out for more? Something in you that wants to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit when you read his word. Is there something in you that wants that overcoming power over sin? That you can put your foot on Satan's neck and say, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to listen to that. No, I'm not going to see that. No, and your no has power. The power is rooted in where you are in Christ. But that second door is where you start to learn to live it. And it's in community. We call it the second door is family. Notice that you go in and out and find pasture. Jesus says, I am the door. I'm, I'm, I'm expecting that you're, you're reading this. So let me just go through. Um, most of, I, Jesus said to them, I am the door of the sheep. All of you came before me are thieves and robbers, and the sheep didn't understand or hear them. I am the door. Jesus is saying this. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in, and he will go out, and he will find pasture. You see, it's, it's different than the first door where you're in. Historically, you're in. Nothing can move you. Now, the second door is a, is a door of movement jostling, coming in and out, the circumstances of life. I will go in and out. Now, there's two sides of this coin, abiding and transformation. In this second door, in this family of God, there is an abiding. In John chapter 15, we read, Jesus is saying, you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you, referring to that first door. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. This abiding is a picture of resting. Abiding, just dwelling in his presence abiding because there is a work to be done and that work is transformation romans chapter 12 i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies as as living sacrifices holy acceptable to god which is your reasonable service and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The, the result of abiding in the second door of family and community, bustling, you know, shoulder rubbing, and everything else, it, abiding in the presence of the shepherd is transformation. We change. These two doors together, an amazing thing happens. Heaven is opened. The amazing thing, John sees this in 
the book of Revelation, chapter 4. Where is, you know the story, geographically, where is John at this point? You tell me. Pardon me? We're bashful today. Where is John when he receives what he sees, that what we call the book of Revelation? Where is he physically? Is he at a bus stop? Where is he? Patmos. Where, what is Patmos? It's a prison island. Yeah, so it's a place, a prison island. You, it's not an island with, with, with bars and walls. There's just water and no one, there's no boats and you can't swim. So he's, on a, he's in prison. And in, in, in this, in this uh, terrible place, he says, And after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Imagine this. There's just a door standing open. He doesn't go into how it opened, because it's already opened. Remember the first door, the opening of that first door is a past tense, Right? That door, he says, he observes, is open. It's just standing open, an open door policy. It's open. And the voice was like a trumpet. So it's not a a brass trumpet that he sees an angel blowing this trumpet. It's a voice, and the voice sounds, it's a trumpet. It's a voice. And the voice says, come up here. Now, he's on an island. How is he going to go anywhere? No boats. You ever notice that prisons are really big on security in their parameter? But the sky is always open. You know that? No one ever thinks to cover up the sky. Because people are earthbound. But not John. John's in prison. And God says to him, come up here. And... Up he goes. And he sees. Immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. The third door is John in prison. And there's no glass ceiling. He's called, come on up. And up he goes. There is this paradox of prison that has to do with this third door. This blew me away when I saw this. Let's look into this a little bit. Look at Jeremiah. You know Jeremiah, where where Jeremiah 33.3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Doesn't that sound similar to what John was told? Come up here and I will show you. Right? Where is Jeremiah? We read uh, Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3. What does verse 1 say? It says, Jeremiah is in prison. He's actually in prison. And the Lord says to him, Call unto me and I will, you know, it's like, come on up here. He's in prison. Then I started thinking about it. Daniel, wait a minute. Wasn't Daniel in captivity? When the entire book of Daniel is written about his story, the whole time, is Daniel ever freed? Does Daniel ever go back to Jerusalem? No, Daniel is totally in captivity when the Lord opens his understanding and opens him up to everything. Daniel is with God, in captivity. Jeremiah is with God, in prison. Oh, wait a minute, what about Joseph? When Joseph was free, he was having all these dreams about himself, right? But when he was, when Joseph was in an Egyptian prison, Joseph is given the eyes to see other people's dreams. Even the dream that eventually of the Pharaoh that would put him on the throne. Joseph is in prison. 
when he is called, come up and listen to this dream, because we've heard that you can see things. And wasn't David running as a fugitive when some of the best of his psalms were written? Hiding in caves, running in Ziklag. David was running as a fugitive when his heart was molded and shaped into the heart of God. What about Paul? Did you realize that the letters to the Ephesians, the Philippians, the Colossians, and to Philemon was written while he was in prison? Paul, in prison, there's no glass ceiling. He is up and he's freely ministering to all the churches because in spite of being in prison. And as I said, John was in the island of Patmos. John was in the island of Patmos, a prison. What is your prison? We're all in some kind of prison, you know. Perhaps there is a vice, an addiction that holds you and won't let you go. And that, that addiction is in itself, it feels like prison, doesn't it? Children, we talked earlier about living under your parents' roof and some of the constraints that come with that. They really hold all the cards, don't they? Um, the food, the money, the keys. So they really have the control, don't they? Does that feel like a prison sometimes? And you feel like you just want to bust out and be your own person? Whether it's little children being told to brush your teeth and clean your room, or if it's older children uh, feeling um, powerless, that can feel like a prison. What about spouses? Does your marriage feel like it's a prison sometimes? There's many songs on the radio written about this very thing. Love, binding, and yet you feel like you just want to shake and bend those bars. But you're there. Does your job feel like a prison? You know, you've you got to go to work because there's bills to pay. But you hate going to work sometimes, and yet you have to. Because if you don't, you don't want to live with those consequences. And so you go, and sometimes, does I'm asking, does your employment sometimes feel like a prison? Are you imprisoned by your own fears? Or does our own pride and selfishness imprison us? Chris, you mentioned this when in, in worship, that Satan tries to throw things at us and tries to condemn us. But no. See, Satan will use the bars on our prison to make us feel imprisoned. Right? Because as long as he can keep us looking horizontally, all we see is bars. But when we look in Scripture and we see what God has done with people who were in prison themselves, and how up is a wide open. We look up and there's no bars up there. Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, and we'll sit together, we'll eat together, we'll, we'll have a banquet. We're, we're going to be in if you open the door. Do you, you see the lie? It's a prison. Are you taunting me, telling me just to open the door? It's a prison. Right? No. Because the top is open. You see, many times in Christian circles, 
uh, there is this obsession to pray against the prison. There is this delusion that if we have enough faith, we can bend the bars. I'm telling you, why is that necessary when there's no ceiling? (laughs) Why? You see, in that constricted place, in that place where you may not want to be, whether it's a home, a family, relationship, employment, a body of sickness, uh, uh, something, whatever it is, there's something happening in being in a place where I don't want to be, where my, the roots of my faith go down deep, where, where I get to the end of myself and I reach out to Jesus. There's something that happens in the midst of hardship, in the midst of the storm, where something changes within us and faith grows and faith develops. What is it when the bars don't move? when you shake the door and it feels like it's locked, the top is open. That's the third door. You see, if you only have come through the first door, first of all, you haven't come through the first door at all. You don't want to waste any time. It's not an intellectual thing. It's It's a hard thing where you say, Jesus, I want to come in and be surrounded by your blood. That's the first door. The second door is this people that you're sitting beside, this this community, this fellowship, this body of Christ, you need to interact and talk and fellowship and share in this second door. It's the sheepfold. It's a process of conformity where we need to, as iron sharpens iron, so does one friend sharpen another. There needs to be that. But when these two things come together, what happens is the top opens, light comes in, And you realize, hey, I'm on the mercy seat. Hey, there's no condemnation here. And at that moment, the bars don't matter. Do you hear any whining in Revelation by John that he's about the island of Patmos? Do you hear any complaining by John about the crazies that were all around him, the criminals that were also there? about the lack of supervision that perhaps made some of the crazies get a little too close to him. Did, he, did you hear anything in Revelation about his condition? No, because it didn't matter. The Holy Spirit took John up and he says, let me show you this, let me show you that. And the reason was because first door framed the second door and in that situation, the third door opens because When Jesus is saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Wait a minute, isn't he the door? How can he, as the door, be standing at the door and knocking? It's the door to our heart. You see the faith it takes when you feel like you're in a prison cell and you've tried that door and you know it's locked and then the voice comes knocking on that prison door saying, open. It takes faith to walk over to that door. The lie is that it's locked. The truth is, is that the blood of Jesus breaks every lock. That's why when the tail, when the, when the veil tore the graves opened because the grave is the ultimate prison the coffin buried six feet under covered in dirt locked up no one can go there they opened when the veil tore because the blood of jesus unlocks the door it takes faith when you're in a prison of any whatever that prison is to get up and go and open the door Because the epiphany is, the blood of Jesus has unlocked the door of my heart. Your door, my door, is unlocked. All we have to do 
is get up and open it. Do you want to do that today?